Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on basic sociology. Today we would be talking on Jurgen Habermas. And for this uh, very discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios, Professor Maitri Chaudhary. Professor Maitri Chaudhary is from Center for the Study of Social Systems, JNU. Uh, Professor Chaudhary has immense experience and uh, her knowledge will definitely help us out in understanding today's topic in detail. Friends, if you want to ask questions from Professor Maitri Chaudhary on today's topic, then do call us through our toll-free number. Our number is 1-800-110-430. I repeat, our number is 1-800-110-430. Now, I would like to request Professor Maitri Chaudhary to give a deep insight into today's topic. Thank well, you very much. The yeah. So, uh, hello everyone. And so, we are back after some time. And what I'm speaking today is on... Rugen Habermas, uh, 1929, he was born in Germany and he continues to be active till this point. If you recall, the last lecture that one gave was on critical theory. Uh, the reason I go back to critical theory, because Rugen Habermas belongs very squarely to that tradition of critical theory or what is also called the Frankfurt School. Many of the issues which the critical theories raised uh, continued to be developed by Habermas. And in a sense, he critiqued, he furthered, and made it more relevant for the last part of the 20th century. Uh, I begin first with the context, that is World War I, uh, Nazi Germany, and post-war Europe. Uh, why, why the context? You will recall that in my early lectures, I have constantly emphasized that theory must not be understood as something that which is written by somebody straight from the head. What people write, the issues they take up, the manner that they discuss it is all very, very centrally linked to the context within which they lived. So now going back to Jürgen Habermas, he was born in 1929. This was a context, if you will recall, where you had the early years, the beginnings of the World War II, the experience of Nazi Germany, and subsequently after World War II, the beginning of a post-World War Europe, which acquired different forms of prosperity, uh, different kinds of capitalism, and different challenges to democracy. Here again, I'm introducing two ideas, the idea of capitalism and the idea of democracy. Just for a little bit, I'll go back to my early lecture again to uh, you know, sort of alert you to the kind of continuities that exist in the manner in which theories are articulated. You will recall in our early discussion when we discussed the emergence and growth of sociology, we referred to three processes. Those three processes was the Enlightenment, French Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution. Uh, now, when we talk about these three, you would notice that these three processes continued to be impacting Habermas's uh, you know, engagement or dealing with the contemporary world and the challenges it threw up. For example, in those early years, enlightenment gave a new perspective to understand the world. Reason became the buzzword that everything could be explained rationally, reasonably, cause and effect could be scientifically validated. However, by the time that you're going to have a mass was being, uh, you know, experiencing both Nazism and World War II, this belief in enlightenment had shaken. If you recall in my last lecture, we had discussed how Adorno himself was also upset with the manner which he felt that the promise that the enlightenment offered had somehow met a different kind of trajectory, that it became science in a certain sense became a myth. Instead of having a reason debate, people started having fundamental beliefs in givens without making the effort to interrogate, to question, or to critique the hallmark of critical theory. 
Apart from enlightenment, the French Revolution emphasized democracy and the Industrial Revolution emphasized the question of capitalism. Both capitalism and democracy were themes which were very central to what Jürgen Habermas was arguing. When it came to questions of capitalism, we have to again go back to what is it which changed at the time of World War II. The argument that Habermas makes and articulates at great length through many of his works, but particularly his work on the public sphere, the theory of communicative action, is the fact that while in the 19th century you had what was seen as a laissez-faire capitalism where the state in a certain sense did not intervene in a direct fashion, what was witnessed in post-World War II Europe and the United States of America was a greater intervention of the state in the running of the economy. In other words, Habermas was a little appalled by the manner in which there seemed to be greater and greater integration between the politics of the state and the economics of the state, which he would argue therefore undermined the possibility of freedom, the possibility of democracy, which he felt was something which was incipient in the 19th century trajectory of democracy or capitalism. So these two concepts were very, very central in the manner that he was sort of looking at it. Now, before we go on to develop what was he that he was critiquing about the nature of democracy and the challenges that it faced in early 20th century and late 20th century, let us very quickly see what was the other context. We saw the empirical context, the historical context of a very affluent post-World War Europe, a context where you had Nazism, a threat to liberty and freedom. And the second context is the intellectual context that Habermas belonged to critical theory. If you notice, some of the key concerns of the critical theorists was capitalism, consumer society, modern state, democracy, market, media, public opinion, public sphere, rationalization, work and leisure. Now go back to each of this, it's there in, your, in the presentation, that Habermas' works from the 1960s were firmly embedded with a negotiation and an attempt to understand the new form and content of these processes. Again, to repeat, capitalism, consumer society, modern state, democracy, market, media, public opinion, public sphere, rationalization, work and leisure. Now, this gets com constantly repeated. What else? How else should we link him in the tradition of the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School? If you recall, the critical theorists had a very different perspective to the idea of theory itself. Going back to the standard positivist understanding of sociological theory or social theory was understood as understanding society as it exists, that we sociologists are supposed to understand the laws of society as it exists. That is, we should not get involved in the normative idea of what is a good society, what is a just society, what our tasks were delineated by some of the early positive sociologists was to explain the laws of society. Habermas and the Frankfurt School, in contrast, believed in a dialectical social theory. That is, they were interested not only with how society functioned, but with notions of justice and social good and what a society ought to be. In that process, therefore, they had a very different relationship between the objective and the subjective realm of society. What do I mean by this objective and the subjective realm of society? Again, we go back to our earlier lessons in sociology where you are familiar with the notion that sociology inspired by the natural science model was keen on finding out the laws of society as objectively presented in society that could be discerned, 
explained and given causal explanation. Whereas in the Marxist tradition of which the critical theories began and uh, you know, belonged and furthered, the idea is that the objective reality or the historical reality is not like the natural reality standing out there, but is created and constructed by human action. That is the understanding of a very dialectical or inextricably linked relationship between human agency individuals, groups and the society out there. That is, I can speak what I can speak because this is what I have learned. You will listen to me and understand depending upon what you understand and what you already know. So what I do, I am speaking, this is my subjective action, but I am not speaking just out of the air. I am speaking based upon existing literature and existing understanding, using tools of uh, technological tools and social tools which are there at my dispensation. In other words, that the reality is socially constructed and there is a dynamic relationship between the objective and the subjective. So, in this sense too, Habermas continued with the tradition of critical theory of society, fleshing out the moral and political dimensions as well as emphasizing the unity of theory and practice. A central concern with the effects of modern enlightenment and thinking on human consciousness as we just saw was very, very central to what uh, the Frankfurt School theorists thought about, that the question of enlightenment has to be interrogated and we have to figure out how is it transforming our lives. It's in this context that Habermas's uh, you know, particular work for which is very, very famous is his whole understanding of the public sphere. What is this public sphere? You know, if you look at it, his study, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, was published in 1962 and contrasted various forms of an active participatory bourgeois public sphere in the heroic era of liberal democracy with a more privatized form of spectator politics in a bureaucratic industrial society in which the media and elites controlled the public sphere. He links this decline of participatory democracy with certain kind of new features. But before I go into it, I want to explain each of these particular terms which we just delineated in his understanding of the public sphere. What did he mean by an active participatory bourgeois public sphere in the heroic era of liberal democracy? He is referring to the 19th century, which he feels was a period marked by more intensive participatory democratic engagement of ordinary people or citizens. Uh, many, many have criticized him for this assumption. Many have in fact argued that Habermas's understanding of the public sphere was in a certain sense utopian, not based on actual historical empirical facts, because his understanding was that there was this you know, ideal bourgeois public sphere where people sat and discussed and talked to each other, they debated, they argued, they put ideas against others' ideas and in that process you had better communication, better understanding and therefore better interaction between different members of society. But critis, critis, uh, the critics of Habermas have argued that in fact, in that period, many sections of the population were denied access to the public sphere. What do I mean by denied access to the public sphere? I mean that traditionally when the liberal theorists developed the idea of a democratic public sphere, though they argued and assumed that all people are born equal and therefore all people have equal rights as citizens, uh, in actual historical experience, as all of us know, women did not have the right to vote. Women were not part of the public sphere. Uh, many of our ancestors who belonged to colonized countries were not part of the public sphere. Uh, the blacks, the colored people were not part of the public sphere. And even among the white dominant communities, women who did not have property, who were not married to property men, did not have access to public sphere. 
Now, in this formulation of Habermas, therefore, we can either say that what he was describing was unreal and therefore it has no value. But others, and including critics of his like Nancy Fraser, would argue that what was Habermas was bringing to the fore, bringing to the table, was the importance to relook at a normative idea of a good public sphere, a democratic and inclusive public sphere. And the fact that there have been criticisms of Habermas's notion of public sphere, in fact, strengthens and alerts people to the necessity of having a democratic system based on an agential and active public sphere where people do have the avenues to debate, to discuss, put forward their views, freedom of expression, to counter ideas with other ideas, not counter ideas with violence, but counter ideas with other ideas, inform discussions which would be based on knowledge of history, the past, politics, comparative uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis of different kind of societies. So this is what he meant by an active participatory bourgeois public sphere. What do we mean by a bourgeois public sphere? This again has a reference to a particular historicity of phenomena. The fact that within the Marxist framework, as you're already familiar with, that when you had the end of feudalism or the end of aristocracy as marked by the dramatic developments of the French Revolution, you had the retreat of the aristocracy, the retreat of the monarchy, and the emergence of the new middle class, the bourgeoisie, who were the new capitalists. And what he means by the bourgeois public sphere, that it was double-edged. What do we mean by double-edged? It is double-edged in the sense that it was more free than an earlier period which was dominated by feudalism, where even theoretically people were not equal. Today we can argue that in a bourgeois public sphere, we are all equal, we all have an equal right to speak, but because of our unequal access to various kinds of institutions and society, our voices are unequally heard. So if I'm wealthy, if I belong to a dominant community, if I'm close to the state, maybe my voice would be heard better than others who do not have this access. So that is the limit of the bourgeois public sphere. But the strength of the bourgeois public sphere, that it rests on the assumption that everybody has an equal voice and an equal right to articulate their views. Now, when he refers to the heroic era of liberal democracy, that is where the problem arises because people say that whereas Habermas saw a decline of the public sphere in the 20th century, many would see it as a point where you had new um, you know, uh, publics, new groups of people. It could be the colonized, it could be women, it could be blacks who were then making their say or their voices present in the public sphere. So it's a tricky thing. In fact, social sciences and sociology are tricky things, you know. You can't just take it, you know, as something which is given because critical theory is historical. It depends on historicity. By saying that something is double-edged, it is not to negate it. It is to show the complexity of the phenomena. So this participatory pub, uh, bourgeois public sphere may have been a historically inaccurate, but what it had is the strength to understand that there is a certain virtue in having that kind of norm as an ideal, that we should have a more participatory democracy there where we can argue and debate more fully to understand each other's view. And he contrasts it with the more privatized forms of spectator politics. Many of you would be very you know, interested perhaps by what he meant by privatized forms of spectator politics in a bureaucratic industrial society in which the media and elites control the public sphere. He is saying that, look, ideally the public sphere should be equal to all and people have to engage. So you have an opinion, I must counter that opinion with facts, with evidence, with rationality. And the best opinion should thereby find its space and there should be a consensus among the different citizens of society.
uh, you know, so we sort of very quickly go back to the points that we were discussing and, you know, very quick points to sum up, to bring back, uh, you know, the key points that we've discussed so far. The fact that for any understanding of theory, you have to look into the question of context. When we say context, there are two kinds of context. One is the historical, social, political, economic context or uh, within which a theorist is born and grows up. The other is the intellectual context, that is, the ideas and theories that which he or she has been influenced and within which tradition they are. In the case of Habermas, we saw that he grew up in Nazi Germany. He grew up as in a family which seemed to be not particularly upset uh, with the regime of the Nazis. And when Habermas later came to know about the kind of uh, you know, criminality which was perpetuated in Nazi Germany, he was extremely upset. And he felt that uh, you know, there must have been something fundamentally different, uh, fundamentally problematic in the fashion uh, in which the public sphere uh, you know, was operating in those countries, that we did not any longer have a participatory bourgeois public sphere. Instead, what we had was a kind of spectator politics. The idea of spectator politics is extremely important because in case of participatory democracy, the citizens are supposed to be informed and engaged in the various issues which pertain uh, to the country or to society at large. In the case of spectator politics, what happens is that even politics is just consumed. So we put the news channel on, we watch everybody fight on news, we hear different kinds of voices and opinions, uh, people shouting at each other. It's more like entertainment. It is not something which furthers critical discussion. This is what he meant by spectator politics. The other point that one was referring to, that he belonged to the intellectual tradition, the intellectual context of the critical theorists, and therefore his great interest in questions of enlightenment, participatory democracy, reason, rationality, capitalism, consumer society, or in what he felt that people had become passive consumers, that they no longer use their minds and their intellect and their knowledge to participate in this society. His idea of the decline of participatory democracy from the 19th to the 20th century, however, has been critiqued by various people, a point I had uh, you know, mentioned um, in, uh, you know, a little while back. The idea because there were two things which were happening, what I meant by the double-edged developments, that in that period when we move into the 20th century, we actually have many social movements and these social movements, whether they are the democratic nationalist movements of colonized country like our own in India or the movements by women and the feminists and other people of color saying that we too are human beings with, great, with as equal rights as yours, as sovereign people. And therefore the argument that Habermas was thinking of one unified public sphere, whereas what probably happens historically, there's a dynamic between multiple or public spheres and counter public spheres. You know, the idea that there are different kinds of publics and they're engaging with each other. So Habermas has been critiqued for that. But what people, even his critics like Nancy Fraser says, that look Habermas brought forward the complicated nature of a media driven democracy and a consumer driven capitalism right to the foreground, which remains valid in 21st century globally and definitely extremely relevant in 21st century India. Now, what were the processes which he felt led to what he describes and what the critical theorists describe as re-feudalization of the public sphere? What do we mean by re-feudalization of the public sphere? You would recall that before capitalism, theoretically, you were supposed to have feudalism. As I mentioned earlier, in a feudal society, inequality is legitimate. So people are supposed to be not just unequal, but it's all right to be equal. Whereas with capitalism and liberal democracy, the idea is that people still may be unequal, but it is legitimate to claim equality that, look, we are all born equal. You know? So this is a major kind of transition which takes place from feudalism to capitalism. However, Habermas argues that with the growth of two things, and he mentions 
state capitalism, culture industries, you have a situation and an increasingly powerful position of economic corporations and big business in public life, you have what he calls re-feudalization of the public sphere. That though we are in a capitalist society, though we are theoretically in a democratic liberal society, the rise of state capitalism, that is a capitalism where the government increasingly plays a big role. So there is greater convergence between the state and the market, between politics and economy. You have greater control over people. The Space for the public sphere therefore shrinks because the public sphere was supposed to be that space which mediated between the state on one hand, the market on the other and between the private interests of people on the other. That space shrinks because you have greater and greater convergence of the market and the state, the economy and the politics of what he describes as state capitalism leads to refutalization, meaning that you have a going back to hierarchy and restrictions of freedom which marked feudalization, uh, feudalism. The second, culture industries. You would recall in our last discussion on Adorno and on um, Marcuse, we discussed culture industries uh, at a certain kind of length. What are these culture industries? The whole set of in, uh, cultural, uh, you know, social institutions like films, televisions, uh, you know, various kinds of fashion industries, advertisements, beauty business, that suddenly culture becomes industrialized. Culture becomes mass produced. So what you wear, the kind of food you eat, whether you should look thin or whether you should look uh, fat, what kind of uh, uh, skin lotions you should use, how you should bring up your children, what kind of house decor you should have, what kind of aspirations you should have, everything then gets dominated by culture industry. And he particularly paid attention to the question of advertisements which start projecting what ought to be the norm, aspirational norm for people. And all of us are familiar with how affected we get by advertisements from the little child, how should the little child be dressed, how should the old grandmother be dressed, where should we go out to eat in restaurants, etc. were all determined and increasingly governed by what he terms culture industries. This dominance would be the argument also leads to re-feudalization of the public sphere. And here, this is a tricky point. It's a tricky point because on one hand, you assume the point that we touched upon some time back is that you are freer, you have greater choice. You can wear whatever you like to wear. You can do whatever you like to do. But on the other hand, your choices are limited by the choices which are offered by culture industries. So when somebody says, you can't dress like this, this is completely completely out of fashion, you are being dominated by what you call the culture industries. So it's an irony of sorts that you become increasingly filled with choices, but those choices are controlled by the increasingly powerful position of economic corporations. They decide what works or what does not work. I'll give you a very small couple of examples from contemporary India. You would be familiar that you had at one point of time great advertisement on baby food that you know the children babies will become very healthy if they are supposed to be given baby food which would be you know whatever uh, company is putting forward milk powder and you have a whole or you must give particular kind of cereals which are bottled or tinned produced by global corporations. And then you had an alternative counter public saying that, look, this is not scientifically proven and breast milk is supposed to be the best. And today you have advertisements which says constantly and very often state driven advertisements which said, look, you must go back to breast milk. But on the other hand, you have a whole alternative, uh, you know, corporations which are suggesting that actually if you really want healthy, beautiful babies, and they'll have visuals of very healthy, beautiful babies. These are the kind of products you should use, or the kind of soaps you should use, or the kind of diapers you should use. So you have increasingly even your private lives being dominated 
by the needs or the requirements of what are large economic corporations. To sum up again, refutilization of public sphere starts taking place. There are three things which Habermas looks at, state capitalism, culture industry and the increasingly powerful positions of economic corporations and big business in public life. On this account, big economic and governmental organizations take over the public sphere while citizens become content to become primarily consumers of goods, services, political administration and spectacle that instead of become participatory citizens in democracy, we sit back and watch. We watch television debates. So on one hand, people may feel that, look, we are more democratic now because we have so many more people coming and arguing. On the other hand, who is called, who is not called, which kind of debate is put forward, which news comes forth, which news do not come forth, may be dependent on the logic of corporations which we do not see. So on this account, to repeat, big economic and governmental organizations take over the public sphere, citizens become mute spectators. They watch politics as a spectacle. The public sphere thereby weakens. So this understanding of public sphere, of course, like I said, has been debated, re-debated. You have various kinds of critiques about the public sphere, whether you did have um, a utopian, an ideal public sphere, the manner in which, uh, you know, Habermas described, or is it always something which was unreal? But even if it was unreal, is it a normative ideal? Now, let's go back to some of the nitty-gritty details of what is it which goes in to making this public sphere. What are the institutions which help us to understand this public sphere? And what do we mean by this public at all when we talk about the public? Very often in India, when we say private sector and public sector, we mean that the public sector is owned by the government owned by the government, the government sector, and the private sector are owned by independent owners or capitalists. This is how we understand in our everyday per, uh, manner of what distinguishes the public sphere and the private sphere. The point that the critical legal theorists are arguing and Habermas is arguing that the public should not be equated with the state or government. When we say public, we mean what is it which is the best and the most desirable and consensual for which the public needs. Let's take the example of public universities. When we have in our country today, uh, you know, an increasing number of private universities which have come up, private institutions which come up, and on the other hand, we have public institutions. Now, people have argued that how do we assess whether a university is really, you know, contributing to public life? Is it only by the criteria that the government owns it? Can that be a yardstick to judge whether it's a public university in the understanding of the public sphere? Or should we, you know, sort of move the question a little differently and ask, are the knowledge which is being produced in a university, are the kind of intellectual training which the universities are giving to the students, are making them more alert informed citizens who are in a better position to discuss and contribute to public good. So should the public good be the criteria to assess the public, not the fact that the state owns a particular university? So in Habermas's understanding, the public sphere is a sphere which should be separate from the state. It should be separate from the market, that is the economy. And it should be separate from the private interests of people. The public sphere should be a place which provides the opportunity for citizens to sit and discuss, debate and argument, to come to a kind of consensus of what constitutes the public good. Where should they come together? Now, in the 19th century European context, in the idea of the bourgeois public sphere, the educated, the intelligentsia, the bourgeois, in other words, would often mean in salons and discuss and debate. In our own country, in India, what is very, very interesting, in the 19th century, when you had the beginning of Western education and you had a large number of associations which came up in India, 
any of you from whichever part of India, go back home and find out if in your town or in your city or in your extended rural areas, was there a movement for libraries? Were there places where people gathered together to have debates? Was there a social reform organization? Was there a women's organization? Were there kind of meets? Were there literary societies? Were there, were there Sangeet Sammelans? These are associations which people as active agents got together. These associations are very important for any public sphere. Many of them could be voluntary. When people get got together in various kinds of library movement in the 19th century saying that we have to educate in order to be liberated, that was part of an active participatory democracy. That is the whole idea of a good public sphere. You could also have a kind of public sphere which is more institutionalized in the manner in which we have parliamentary democracy. That in a parliament, ideally, people should come with information, ideas, views and debate that look if you have a particular tax regime or a new bill come about, it has its limits. Now, it's the task of the opposition and the opposition would say that, look, this is impacting this section of people badly or it is impacting that section of badly. The government listens to it and adapts and changes. That is the role of a parliament. That is the role of the opposition and the ruling political party and the debates are conducted within the parliament. That is another site for the public sphere could be more institutionalized. Habermas was unhappy with representative parliamentary democracy, which he felt would become very mechanical, and he wanted a more participatory democracy. You could then have media, journals, newspapers, print media, which could then also become extremely important for debates and discussions. Now here, there have been new developments which have, in a certain sense, even a change from the time when Habermas, after all, wrote this piece in 1962, things have changed dramatically. Many of his critics have argued that he has emphasized on print journalism, you know, the whole idea of the print media. And the written, the written work is very different. You know, when you have to read a book, it takes more time. You have more space, but you have to think, you have to reflect, you have to assimilate. However, increasingly, when we move to the electronic mode, where there is more visuals, you know, the visuals are more entertaining, they are more appealing, but often they do not inspire very great critical thinking. Not necessarily, you may still have two-minute films which are deeply provocative, but you may also have visuals that are extremely attractive and entertaining, but in a certain sense, what we often call a dumbing down. At the end of it, you, you don't learn anything new. You just see a spectacle of various kinds of views coming across and thrashing each other, which is scintillating, it's like a bullfight, but it does not make you think and become a participatory agent. So people have said that Habermas did not look at the manner in which the media itself had transformed. That the media, which once the whole issue of media was that, uh, you know, the state controls the media and people were very wary of state censorship. And they felt that if the media is controlled by the state, you will not have freedom and democracy. But we have now moved to the other extreme where the media is not controlled by the state very often. Sometimes it is controlled by the state, but it may be controlled by corporations in the markets which have their own agenda. In the early 90s, you know, since I do a little bit of work on the media, there were debates about what kind of information or news should be presented in the media. And they said, like, people are no longer interested in stories of famines and plagues and disasters. What they want is sunny side journalism. So you had a whole culture of what we now call infotainment, that news is just not information. Information has to be coupled with entertainment. And the logic of this kind of media necessarily erodes critical thinking very often. And that is why one feels that Habermas, the critical theorists, have a particularly role, particular role in the contemporary period. We come now to the tail end of our discussion on the life, world, and system. 
what did he mean by the life world and the system? In a certain sense, Habermas's whole argument about participatory democracy, about the shrinking space of the public sphere, of passive spectatorship instead of participatory democracy, is linked to his two concepts of what he calls life world and system. What do we mean by life world and system? The first point that modern societies are very dualistic, that is, they have two kinds of divided worlds, one the world of the life world and the other of the system, unlike pre-modern society. As all of you are familiar, since you are, most of you are doing sociology, you'd be familiar with Durkheim, you'd be familiar with the question of organic solidarity and mechanical solidarity, and how in a pre-modern society, particularly in simple societies, everybody was more or less like everybody else. There was less differentiation, less differentiation between the different spheres of society, that is between politics and economics, between family and kinship and culture. There was a certain sense, a kind of integration. To give very quick examples, again, which all of you would be familiar with, in a pre-modern society, say take an agricultural society, you would have a cycle, the calendar. The calendar would be linked to agricultural calendar, uh, the time when you sow the seeds, the harvesting calendar, you have a certain kind of calendar which is built with the ecology of the place. You also have cultural festivals which are linked with the agricultural calendar. So you would have certain kind of festivals at harvesting time. Uh, you would have dance and music, certain kind of food. Uh, you would have certain kind of ceremonies. Uh, you would have marriages usually held at a particular point which would allow you in a kind of world dominated by the agricultural cycle. So there was an integration between the economy, between politics, between culture between your personal life, between your own expressive forms of how you enjoyed your lives. Whereas in a modern world which becomes more complex, you have a more differentiated system. The economy gets increasingly separated, specialized, politics is specialized, culture, and the term culture industry indicates it, becomes a specialized industry. Differentiation defines the modern world. In this world, you have a fundamental distinction between what we call the life world and the system. The life world is people's interaction with each other, the way we communicate with each other, our expressive world, our emotive world, how do we interact with each other. And the system, which is the compelling logic of the economy or the politics, is macro and is extremely powerful. And it dominates the life world. So you have a certain kind of schism leading to various kinds of discrepancies between our private and public life. Not surprisingly, even the classical thinkers were engaged with this whole idea of, say, anomaly or alienation, the disjunction between the life world and the system. Habermas would argue further that there are system domains System domains, meaning the say for the economic domains, the material domains, specializing in the material reproduction of capitalism and the bureaucratic state, that these are systems, large scale system. The state is a huge system. All of you are familiar of how large the government is, how many departments are there, how what kind of specialization is there, what are the vertical structures of those systems, what are the horizontal integration of the system. They are enormous. Look at a marketing system, look at a very big corporations. They may have you know, um, companies in every small town, every city. They may have uh, their headquarters in New York, but they may have their marketing division somewhere else. You have increasingly huge material reproduction of capitalism, on the other hand, and huge expanding bureaucracy of both the state and institutions. And all of us in our own individual lives work within those structures, work within those system domains, what he calls the system domains. He says, as compared to these system domains, large scale economy, politics, you have on the other hand, a modern life world, specializing in symbolic reproduction, the nature of the self, socialization, cultural trans transmission. Traditionally, we had already mentioned, 
we saw that how the economy and politics were so closely integrated, culture was so closely integrated, what people learnt, learnt informally in the family, in the neighbourhood, playing around with peer, cousins, friends. For my generation, holidays would be in going to uncles and aunts' houses, maybe a few miles away, maybe a hundred miles away, spending time with cousins, spending time with the life world was very much part. Whereas in today, how do we get ourselves entertained? How do we entertain our children? There is a whole world of symbolic rep reproduction which has also become huge. That is, we are increasingly socialized, maybe by the media, by larger structures, by cultural transmission. All of us, many of us nowadays talk about children and how exhausted the parents are taking them to dance classes or music classes or then taking them for tuition and then taking them for competitive exams. That is our private lives, our life world has been dominated by the system. In this situation, Habermas's solution or his way forward is the idea of communication that let us talk and he privileges the use of language through which we can communicate and talk to each other. This too has been critiqued, saying that language is after all something which itself is embedded by the social. Meanings change. In fact, media changes the meaning of the words which we use. So whether linguistic communication, as Habermas talked about, is a way forward, we do not know. But what we do know is the critical theorists and Habermas has alerted us to a mechanical spectator passive idea of democracy where we just watch, see and say, oh, we like this person, he speaks well, or we like that person, she looks good. That that should not be the criteria of a participatory democracy. We have to judge the content and the substance of the arguments which we put forward and therefore the emphasis on communication. Thank you very much. With this note, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much for uh, giving us a productive session on Habermas. And dear friends, we believe that you might have learned a lot from today's uh, session. Ma'am, what else are we going to study in our future sessions? Yeah, because we've now finished the critical theory, so we've probably moved to Foucault and Bourdieu sometime later. Uh, probably first Foucault and then Bourdieu, you know. Definitely, dear friends, we would be uh, continuing with uh, all the topics as mentioned by Professor Metri Chaudhary over here in our forthcoming sessions. And uh, if you have um, any query or if you want to have a session on a particular topic, then do write to us at info.cec at nic.in. Friends, we are going to upload this lecture on YouTube for you very soon. And we want you to see the lecture and afterwards, if you feel so, that you have certain questions to be answered, then do write to us at the same ID, that is info.cec at nic.in. Your feedbacks are also very important for us. We will try to give answers to your questions when next time Professor Chaudhary visits our studio. But before that, you need to write to us and keep writing us and keep watching us. You can see all the lectures pertaining to the series uh, Basic Sociology on YouTube. For that, you need to log on www.youtube.com slash CEC Edusat. This is our YouTube channel where you will get uh, all the lectures pertaining to the series as well as all the lectures pertaining to the uh, different series on uh, different subjects too. So friends, uh, we are taking your uh, leave over here with the promise that we would be meeting soon and uh, before leaving, I would like to thank Professor Metri Chaudhary once thank again for much. her uh, deep insight and deep uh, inputs to the lecture. Thank you ma'am. Thank Thanks you so very so much, much and thank you dear friends for watching us.